Welcome back to our video series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You and I have looked into this topic from the general perspective of the Holy Spirit and why he distributes these gifts. In this last episode for this season, we need to tackle the potentially controversial topic of the miraculous gifts. These go by many categorical names. Sometimes they're called the revelatory gifts. Sometimes they're referred to as sign gifts. But whatever name is given, this category generally includes the gift of tongues, healing, the gift of prophecy, and then the broader category of the gift of miracles. The controversy that divides Christians in the 21st century is whether we believe that these gifts continue to be distributed by the Holy Spirit today. Pentecostal and charismatic believers in the church hold to the belief that the Spirit is currently distributing these gifts, that they are active and have an important purpose in the church. The other side of the family of believers for the most part, believe that these gifts have ceased to be distributed after the establishment of the first century church. We start our exploration by noting this. This is a secondary theological issue and should not divide the fellowship of the church. The second thing that we want to keep in mind before diving in any further into this discussion is that both sides of this argument can make a biblical case for their position. So if you're ready to jump in, I'm Pastor Warren. This is Walk the Walk. Let's get started. Let's begin by looking at the individual gifts, whether we view them historically as something that the Bible records in the first century or we see them as current manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Each of these gifts plays an important role in the life of the church. The gift of tongues, for example, was a sign of the Holy Spirit's power at Pentecost. This spiritual endowment enabled men of all nations to understand the spoken gospel and then respond to it. Even though the message had been delivered in a language they didn't understand, a language they didn't speak. They were able to respond to the gospel. When we see it in that context, it becomes a relatively simple matter to understand the purpose of the gift. Similarly, when we see the apostles with healing gifts that mirror those of their master Jesus, this ability guaranteed that they were seen as the unique emissaries of Christ, that they were as they planted and discipled the early church. In both of these brief examples, the Holy Spirit's power affirms the work of the apostles or is a necessary component of that work. If we see historically in the age of the apostles as occurring in the first century, then their mission to establish the church is done. That logically lends support to the view that these gifts were left back in that time as the church has become mature. A lot has been written and said about the gift of tongues, and by that measure, it's the most controversial of all the spiritual gifts. This controversy extends beyond the cessation continuation argument. For some groups within the church, speaking in tongues is considered to be the initial physical evidence of your receipt of the Holy Spirit. This belief extends then to say that those Christians without the gift of tongues are either not true Christians or second-class Christians. And this creates a division that the Bible speaks strongly against. This spiritual gift also has two parts that are both necessary for it to be complete. As Peter Wagner defines the gift, he writes this, it is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the church to speak to God in a language they have never learned and um, or to receive and communicate an immediate message from God to his people through a divinely anointed utterance in a language they have never learned. 
to put that in simpler language, this is the ability to speak in a foreign tongue and the ability to interpret someone else speaking in that foreign tongue. This would be the gift that we see on display at Pentecost. The Bible also describes a speaking gift that has a more private sense. This is a this is often referred to as a, a prayer language, a, a language used in your private prayers where no interpretation is necessary. Private means that this is not for use in a public gathering where it could cause confusion, but for one's prayer time as a way of deepening your experience with God. We can bring some clarity to the difference between prayer tongues and the Pentecost experience by noting that the word glossa in Greek, that this is what we find in the Bible, can mean any kind of vocalization. And this supports the lack of need for interpretation. In either case, the Apostle Paul appears to try to temper the church's enthusiasm for the gift of tongues, something we should probably take into account today. Prophecy in the modern church is another controversial gift because it challenges the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. This doctrine of sufficiency simply says that God has revealed to us in the Bible everything that we need to know, making new revelation in the form of prophecy unnecessary. Those who believe in the modern gift of prophecy are careful in their definition, calling it a special ability that the Spirit gives to be able to receive and repeat an immediate message of God. In the apostolic age, there were countless examples of prophecy, and these prophecies became part of the revealed Word of God in the Bible. Similar to the gift of tongues, Prophecy has a biblical requirement that it be tested. We're familiar with the requirements of Deuteronomy 18 for validating prophecy as actually coming from God, as well as the penalty for being a false prophet. As the scriptures took shape, God's recorded word expanded the tools for evaluation. No prophecy that conflicts with the already revealed Word of God should be, should ever be, accepted as valid. A disturbing trend in the modern church is the growing laxity of this verification. Many in the charismatic side of the family affirm that it's okay if prophets are in error. Peter Wagner, for example, says that true prophets should be willing to be corrected. Look at that now. Wagner says that they should submit their prophecy for evaluation by Scripture, and if they're found to be wrong, then they should apologize. This, uh, this means that, that what God told them, the, the prophecy that they deliver, um, was wrong. Now, that is not the biblical standard of prophecy God himself gave us. If a modern-day prophet delivers something in error, uh, if he delivers something that is self-serving or something that doesn't edify the church, this lends validation to those who believe that the gift remains in the first century. The gift of healing demands a little finesse in our understanding within this category of revelatory gifts. This gift is said to endow individuals the ability to bring divine power to physical human healing. The gift is not an innate power in the individual Christian. He or she serves as an intermediary through which God's power flows to cure illness or, or restore health. Some Christians do not see this as a spiritual gift separate from the, you know, the broader category of miracles, and others don't see it as a gift at all. They view any healing as a discreet action by God in specific circumstances. In other words, unlike the gift of leadership or, or wisdom that can be brought to bear at will all the time, the gift of healing doesn't operate in this blanket fashion. One with the gift of healing, for example, can't go into a cancer ward and by the exercise of this gift, empty out all of the beds by curing everybody. This gift never intended to work that way. 
Unfortunately, the gift of healing is also a favorite of charlatans who draw needy people to themselves by promising to heal their infirmities. Careful Bible readers recognize that God never works this way. We see the apostles healing, but nowhere does scripture say that everyone they encounter is healed. We read of ailments continuing on or, or medicinal remedies being used for healing. Paul suffered his thorn in the flesh for God's glory, and his recommended cure to Timothy's stomach problem was wine. In the context of the Bible, it is perhaps best to see healing as the will of God rather than a power that can be exercised by human agents. So, is there warrant for believing that the revelatory gifts continue to be distributed in our day? The discussion of cessation versus continuation is much longer than we have time for in this episode, and good-hearted, mature Christians can come to different conclusions. Because this is a, a secondary theological issue, a secondary component of belief, it should never be the seed of division in a church, although we recognize that abuse can occur in the exercise of these gifts. Studying the Bible to locate evidence for the cessationist position, we have to recognize that there is no direct exegetical support for claiming that any of the gifts have ceased to exist. As one of my seminary professors, Craig Blomberg, writes and, and taught us, the spiritual gifts of every stripe are God's endowments for Christian service in the New Testament, and they are the fundamental way that ministry occurs in the church. To take a continuationist position, simply the belief that the miraculous gifts continue today, demands discernment. There is no guarantee that any manifestation of the Spirit is genuine. Each one must be tested against Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, 39-40 brings the Apostle Paul's discussion of the topic to a close with crystal clear commands. If we obey this imperative to test everything against Scripture, these instructions would go a long way to eliminating division in the church over these gifts. Maturity encourages us to take a cautious approach to all the spiritual gift manifestations, particularly the miraculous. Over this season of Walk the Walk, we have surveyed the ministry of the Holy Spirit of Christ. The spiritual gifts do not comprise the whole of his ministry, and it's important that you and I do not allow our study or our naivete about the gifts to obfuscate his person or purpose. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, given to those who are in Jesus for our blessing and our security. The gifts that he distributes are given to advance God's work and for the benefit of other Christians in the church. You and I may differ in our belief in the ongoing existence of the miraculous gifts, but our discipleship should build a maturity in us that enables us to hold that belief lightly, maintaining the unity of the body to the glory of God. Be blessed, my friends, in your exercise of the amazing power of the Holy Spirit. <music>